Good morning. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ on this beautiful October morning. We are so glad that you are starting your day worshiping with us here at Second Christian Church. Thank you to those of you who are gathering with us online this morning. Uh, let us know that you're there and that you can see and hear us. We are uh, really pleased to welcome back our second Sunday jazz trio, Plus One. We welcome special guest Russ Grazier on uh, saxophone this morning as they present some of the music of saxophonist and composer Dave Binney. We know you'll enjoy it. A reminder to you that masking is optional here at Second Christian, but we do ask that you mask up when we stand to sing. We are a mask-affirming church, and if you are more comfortable remaining masked the whole time, you are welcome, of course, to do that. We invite you also to join us downstairs for a time of refreshment and fellowship following worship, uh, where there will be some delicious goodies and some hot coffee to enjoy, as well as some good company. There is a date for the Evergreen Festival. Our annual church fair will be held on Saturday, November 19th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, we are coming back this year after a little bit of a hiatus, and I can't remember why we, snot, we weren't doing it, but it's way back there. We're doing a gourmet basket. The uh, doorkeepers are, are uh, creating a gourmet basket as part of the raffle. And if you will, would like to make a donation of some items to the gourmet basket, either a, um, an item or a, a gift card or, or anything to put in the gourmet basket, uh, there will, it will be ready for your donation next Sunday. And if you have questions about that, see Melissa, whose hand is up now. There we go. Thank you, Melissa. Let us continue in our worship. I have one more thing. Um, some of you noticed me scrambling to change the numbers on the hymn boards at the front of the church, um, but the band might not have noticed that. So the final hymn is indeed number 658, Restless Weaver. The words are correct, the number in the bulletin is wrong. So um, I'll meet you there at the end. Our call to community is printed in our bulletins. Let us read responsibly. We come betwixt, uh, come beloved of God and pause in the place of liminal longing. We come betwixt and between pulled in many directions. Trust that the Holy One is already forming a new creation in you. We come trusting God's mercy center and change us. Indeed, the Holy One calls you by name for deeds of mercy. May God's ancient action be a present presence, and we gather here today. Our opening hymn is number 290, I Cannot Dance, O, o Love. Let us stand and sing responsibly.
us join together in a gathering prayer. Holy love, take our weary waiting and form in us a readiness for renewal. Shape our hearts for healing, our minds for mending, and our souls for sharing. Let no weight of the moment prevent our remembering of your long reach of faithfulness. Cast over the whole creation. Still us enough to discover again your prayer rising in our praying, that we may be formed by your love made known to us in Jesus Christ. By this, change us on the inside that our outer lives may more clearly reflect your will and way of mercy in the world. Amen.
Let us pray together. Make ancient words new and lost hope rise again as you speak the promise to us this day. O spirit of truth, O life-giving breath, amen. Our first scripture lesson is a reinterpretation of Psalm 66, verses 1 through 12. This morning we will read from the Living Psalms. In the collection, the Psalms have been reinterpreted in poetry and art as a reflection of God's work of justice and compassion in our midst today. Today's selection was written by Maria Mankin, Don and Marin Tobasi's daughter. Marin is also the editor of this collection. Let us listen to the word of God. Living Psalm 66, 1 through 12, Pentecost 18c. When the world was first formed, we knew without yet having heard the words God saw that it was good, that it was so. God's grace shone brilliantly, the sun in the sky, the rain, and the plants reaching up to rejoice in it all. We knew that it was good. We began to sing praises, to bathe in the storms, dig in the dirt, nourish our bodies with the richness of God's grace. We reveled in the abundance and raised our voices to reflect the awesomeness of God's love and the goodness of the earth. And then the floods came and the fires. The earth raged against our yoke, struggled to free itself from the burden of our unending necessities. We cried out to God to release us from the horrors we brought upon ourselves, and we suffered. We failed God's test of compassion for each other, for our breathtaking, singular, extraordinary world. We prayed for rescue from the mess we made, and no one answered, it seemed. Until we rested, we took a fearful breath and saw hands reaching into the swirling storm, drains, feet rushing back into the flames when the ground beneath them was charred and seemed beyond saving. The scales fell from our eyes then, and we witnessed God's work on earth, rebuilding, resolute and afraid, answering the call, inviting more than prayers, the holy, living strength all around us, a reminder that this is good and God is with us still. Living Psalm 66. Let us listen also for the word of God as it comes to us in the gospel according to Luke. And this morning I'm going to be reading from the First Nations version of the New Testament, an indigenous people's translation. On his way to village of peace, that is Jerusalem, creator sets free, that's Jesus, took the path following the border between High Place, Samaria, and Circle of Nations, Galilee. He went into a small village where 10 men with a skin disease came across his path. They kept a respectful distance from him and called out loudly, Creator sets free, honored one, they pleaded. Have pity on us. Creator sets free, looked at them and said, Go to the holy men and show yourselves to them. They did what he said. And as they were on the way, they were healed. One of the ten men, when he saw he was healed, returned to Creator Sets Free, giving loud praise to the Great Spirit. He then bowed down to honor Creator Sets Free and offered him thanks. This man was from the high place, from Samaria. Creator Sets Free said to those who were watching, were not ten men healed? Where then are the other nine? 
was the only one who returned to give thanks and honor to the great spirit, an outsider from the high place? Then he said to the man, stand up and be on your way. Your trust in me has healed you. Here ends the reading of the lessons. May God bless our reading, hearing, and understanding of these words. And it was good. Amen. Way back in chapter 9 of Luke's gospel, 
way back in June. Way back then, Luke told us that Jesus set his face for Jerusalem. And he, with those words, closed out the chapters of Jesus' ministry in Galilee and begins the long journey to bring Jesus' healing and teaching ministry to the holiest place in all of Israel, to the village of peace, to Jerusalem. And Luke says it again today to remind us that Jesus is still on his way, that Jesus still knows where he is going, still knows what he is doing. We knew eventually that it had to come to this, right? Since we know our biblical geography so well, We know that Galilee is up here and Jerusalem is down here. And we knew that unless they were going to go all the way to the west and cross the Jordan into the wilderness and go that way, or west to the sea and head down to Jerusalem that way unless they were going to go way, way out of their way they were going to have to go through Samaria. And we also remember, of course, the welcome that was not extended to Jesus' disciples, to his band of followers. When they first began their ministry, they went into a Samaritan village. And they were ushered along the way. You're going to Jerusalem? Well, just go along. We don't want you here. And we remember that the disciples, so incensed by this, they asked Jesus if they should call fire to rain down from heaven on that village. And Jesus said, no, we'll just keep going. And here they are again today walking the path right between Syria. Samaria and Galilee, and Jesus now has another opportunity to teach his disciples. So what will Jesus do? We remember, of course, don't we, that Jews and Samaritans didn't hang out together. There was a strong historical border between them, a religious, social, ethnic barrier that kept them separated. Leprosy is one of the few things that could break that barrier. See, the lepers were all put together, regardless of where they were from, what they believed. We want you away from us. These are the COVID-positive people of the first century. Please stay away. The scripture says they kept a respectful distance from Jesus when they called out to him. Ten of them, Luke tells us, see Jesus and they name him. Most of our Bibles say, Master, have mercy on us. One translation I have says, Boss, have mercy on us. Today, we read, honored one, 
have pity on us. Whatever translation you use, they use a name for him that is used only a handful of times in Luke's gospel and until today is only used by Jesus' disciples. This is a special name that they have for Jesus. And these lepers in this village on the border between Galilee and Samaria, they know that name. They know that person. Master, boss, honored one, have mercy on us. There's no further interaction, according to Luke's account. There's no rubbing dirt on them or making mud out of spittle or laying hands on him. Jesus just sends them off. Go show yourself to the priests. Go show yourself to the holy men. So they head off. They do what he said. They go to the priest to be checked out. They go to the priest, who is the only person who could send them home to families and communities. The only person who could fully restore them to the life they knew. The only person who could pronounce them clean, ritually, ceremonially, communally clean. And Luke tells us that on, as they are on their way, they were healed. This is a funny little story, isn't it? We don't know what happened. We only hear a part of the story again. Did that one, just that one person notice? Did that one person not stop and say, hey guys, look, I'm better. Did the others notice too, but just kept walking? If they did notice, then what should they do now? Should they, do, should they go back and thank Jesus? Or should they do exactly what Jesus told them to do? Go see the priest and be restored. I can imagine them feeling a little caught in the middle here, right? A little betwixt and between. Pulled, as our call to worship said, in many directions, two at least. They're anxious to put this unfortunate chapter of their lives behind them. They're anxious to get back home. They're anxious for something new. As I said, it's a confusing little story but once again, maybe that's just the point. What we do know is that somewhere along that road, the Samaritan, the one in 10 that we know is from away, noticed two things. He realized two things. The first, he noticed that his skin is clear, that he's healed. We don't know if the others noticed, but one at least did. And the second thing he realized is that going to the priest is not going to do anything for him because he was a Samaritan. And he was not welcome in that place. He was probably not even allowed 
into the temple, into the synagogue. The priests would have still said, stay away. The welcome that the Samaritans did not extend to Jesus' disciples was the exact same welcome that he would not get when he went to see the priests. So he just says, I'm going home. But on his way, he stops back to thank Jesus. And of course, Jesus asks the question, the really hard, confusing to me question, where are the other nine? Because they were doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. What on earth do we do? Next Saturday is our main conference annual meeting. If you are willing to be a delegate, let me know. It's uh, 9 a.m. to noon-ish by Zoom, so you don't even have to travel out of your kitchen to attend. And at this year's annual meeting, the Social Justice Action Committee is introducing a resolution for support of tribal sovereignty in Maine. And I invite you to go look that up. I'll actually put a link on the um, church Facebook page later on today. But as tomorrow, as you may know, is Indigenous Peoples Day in Maine, I thought I'd share a little bit about this but I think it actually fits what we're talking about here, too. So the resolution, um, this is how they describe it. The resolution advocates action to improve all manner of affairs pertaining to the sovereignty, self-sufficiency, and cultural identity of the tribes in Maine. The 1980 Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act was promising in furthering that cause. However, in the last several years, substantial effort has gone into improving the act after 40 years of mixed results in living with it. That long paragraph began, the resolution advocates action. Resolutions are a dime a dozen, right? We, we pass a resolution and put it in the file cabinet. This resolution advocates action. And one of the actions the resolution supports is reparations for past harms, for things that European settlers have inflicted on the native people in Maine. One case in point is the removal of Native American children from their homes to attend what they used to call Indian residential boarding schools. These have been in the news lately in Canada and in our country as well. And the stated goal of these schools was to kill the Indian and save the man. That was the policy kill the Indian, and save the man. And this went through the 1800s into the 1900s and ended not all that long ago. In Maine, in the 1960s and 1970s, this was still the practice. Wabanaki children are still way overrepresented in Maine's foster care system. We are still taking 
Native American children out of their homes. Reparations for past harms, we don't know what form that would take, but the resolution calls for action. The other action that the resolution calls for is the restoration of sovereign tribal lands. Restoration of sovereign tribal lands. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that. Indeed, the entire state of Maine, all of New England, is unceded tribal land. We took it. So, what are we doing? Is the action that the main conference is going to give back the land that Pilgrim Lodge sits on around Lake Cabasicanti? Are they going to invite churches around the state to return land to the Wabanaki people? Are they going to ask us to give back this plot of land to the people who lived here for centuries before the Europeans came? Are they going to ask us to give up our homes? To sell them off and give the money away? I think the answer is no. I'm pretty sure the answer is no. It would be a wildly unpopular policy. It would be a good way for me to get kicked out of this pulpit. But just asking the question, just raising the issue might just begin a conversation worth having. What do we mean by that? What do we mean by action? See, justice is a difficult thing. We all say we want it. We all say it's a good thing. We if we do the Pledge of Allegiance at, at school or at a civic event, we, we finish it with liberty and justice for all. For all. We think justice is a good thing until it asks something of us. Maybe something too much. Maybe more than we expect, more than we can do. And we find ourselves in that uncertain place between maybe knowing what is just and knowing what is possible. We find ourselves a little less certain how much we want liberty and justice for all. We find ourselves betwixt and between. And it's a hard place to be. More and more, I find myself in that exact place. A little less certain of what I think I used to know. Maybe you do too. Maybe you also find your place, yourself in that place where we, we think we know what is right, what is good, what is just. 
we're just not sure what we should do, whether we can pay the price. How many of you have driven on Whipple Road lately? Yeah. We say we want good roads and safe roads and sidewalks, but we do not love the construction. No, no. We say that we want good paying jobs. Our Neighbors in Need campaign is is focused this year on uh, works of economic justice. And we say we want economic justice until it comes time to pay for our groceries that are getting more expensive for a number of reasons. We went out to breakfast on Friday. And we're like, we used to be able to go out for breakfast for 10 bucks. And that's not the case anymore. We want good schools. We want our children to be educated well and to have a great, great learning environment and wonderful teachers. And then three times a year, that tax bill comes. We want something new. We say, oh, new is a, is a good thing, right? Mostly. I know, it's me. Maybe it's just me. We say we want something new, but we don't always want to let go of what was, of what is. We find ourselves more often than we care to admit betwixt and between. Hearing what somebody said and knowing in our heart what we really need to do. When we find ourselves in that place, may we remember that God will meet us there and God will walk, it, walk with us to the next place. Amen. Amen. We come now to the time in our worship when we are invited to lift up the prayers of our hearts, and our lives together. And I invite you now to share names and situations that should be in our prayers today and through this week. Samira. How's Emmy doing? We'll keep Emmy in our prayers. Anybody online, Alan? People in Thailand. People in Ukraine. We'll keep the world in our prayers, yes. Let us pray. O God of all generations, God of all creatures, God of every leaf and grain of sand, we bring our praise for your whole creation. 
God of birth and death and resurrection, we are bound together by the knowledge of your love for us, for each and every one of us. We give thanks for the complex beauty of your lands and seas. We stand in awe before you for the power of storms and tides. We delight in the color of the leaves, the creatures that populate our communities. We cherish the love of family and friends, knowing that it comes from you. God of love and hope, today we know how much it means to us to have a home, a place, a home in faith, a place where we can celebrate the good news of your presence in our lives. And yet we know that many places are cut off from the joy of that good news. Today, we lift up the people of Thailand, the people of Ukraine. We pray for peace in our world. Pray for those who are putting lives back together, turned upside down by Ian and Fiona. We pray for those recovering from COVID and those working to protect themselves. We pray also today for Samira and Emmy, for all those who need your healing presence in their lives, for those whose names we lift up to you now in silence, and for ourselves. So many times, oh God, we don't know what to do. There are so many people who need healing, and the help we have to offer seems too small to make a difference. Where are you calling us to be your hands and feet? What are you asking us to do? What action? are we called to take to bring your healing love to a world in need? O oh God who dwells within us, we raise our prayers for those in need, for those who grieve, for those who suffer sickness and pain, for those who have no home, no food. Hear our prayers, O God. For we ask them, as always, in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to be bold and say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We come now to the time in our worship when we are invited to respond with a financial offering. We will, as has become our custom, not be passing the plates. There are plates on the table as you leave. If you would like to leave an, a gift there, we would be grateful. There are offering envelopes there for our neighbors in need offering, which we'll be receiving through this month. And we invite you to give to that. Um, as we listen to the um, music that our jazz quartet is bringing us today, I invite you to consider what work of justice God might be calling you to do. What is the action that we can take? Let us worship God with our tithes and our offerings. Amen. Let us bless our gifts. Holy One, 
In Jesus, you have shown us what your heart is like, merciful and abounding in steadfast love. Form that same spirit in us, that our lives may become continual prayers of thanksgiving. Let no cry of your creation go unheard. Form us as agents of practical praise, molding us with mercy for a world crying out for healing. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 658, Restless Weaver. And now may the God who shakes heaven and earth, the God whom death could not contain, the God who lives to disturb and heal us, bless us with power to go forth from this place and proclaim the good news in all the world. Amen. <laughs>